Okay. Any time. All right. This is the XP2. This means experimental project number two. This is the second home built helicopter I built. And this helicopter here is powered by O320 Lycoming. It's a B2C and it's an old Robinson engine. And it was overhauled and we put it in here vertically. And when you do that, you have to put a dry sump system on it so the oil flows down to the bottom there and is recovered so that the engine can use it. And also, if you look at the valve covers, the valve covers have small little stainless lines going into them. We had to oil the top end of the engine in the rocker area because there's no oil being pumped up there when the engine's in the vertical position, at least very little. That engine turns at 2750 RPM and it's transmitted into this transmission which is five and a half to one reduction. And this transmission doesn't have any planetary gears at all. So our main rotor turns clockwise if you look down from the top rather than counterclockwise. And that's French or Russian style as far as rotation goes. But that transmission is just sitting there in uh, 90 weight hypoid oil and that's what lubricates and cools it. And then the swash plate, the non-rotating star which is here and the rotating star which is here powers up its inputs to this balance beam and that beam in turn keeps everything in a box. In other words, the bar up at the top acts the same as this beam right here by allowing this whole system to move as a unit. And that's how we work our cycling, is we're actually flying the blades and the hub all as one big disc. So when we pull collective, see this lever goes up. When we pull collective, you can see how it drops down and we're adding pitch. Now that pitch is what makes us go vertical and horizontal and backwards and forwards. Cut the collective again. Okay, well the collective in this helicopter, it's, of course its main function of course is to get the helicopter up and off the ground, but it's tied to a series of bell cranks in here under the seat and of course behind the seat here. And it operates this whole mechanism up and down and that's how we put total pitch into both of the blades. So when we pull collective, the blades trailing edge drops down and we bite more air. We push the collective down, the blades trailing edge goes up and we're biting less air. And this is normally used when you're landing and also in auto rotation. You want flat pitch for the collective all the way at the bottom. Normally when you're in cruise flight, the collective is probably about I would say a third of the way up or about this much pitch. That's not a whole heck of a lot, but it makes a big difference when you've got 160 horsepower behind it. The cyclic, it moves the swash plate independently on all three axes, back and forth, fore and aft, and that's what actually changes the individual pitch of the blades as they're swinging around in a circular motion and that's what causes you to fly forwards or backwards or sideways and it's all put in independently rather than collectively like you see with the collective action. Now when you're flying a helicopter, especially an experimental like this, it's good to keep your hands on the controls all the time. So we have controls located on the end of the collective for the starter and for the RPM control, when you turn this on and say you're in a hover, you push this little red button and you just keep pushing it until your RPMs come up into the green on the instrument panel and then you can basically stop and forget about twisting the throttle. At the same time, if it's evening, you want to hit the landing light, no problems, you just take your thumb and flip the switch, therefore you don't have to take your hand off. Now the throttle is right here and it twists just like the Brantley we saw. You move it outwards and the throttle the RPMs increase. You move it inwards, the RPMs decrease. The cyclic stick has your controls for the microphone and for your cargo release. And I'll show you the cargo hook in a little bit, but this little lever right here is in case the electronic release doesn't work. This hook is a manual connection to that cargo hook and it will allow you to release the load if you have an electrical failure. Now when we're flying along in the experimental XP2, 
we're monitoring all kinds of stuff from carb temperature to outside temperature to our feet and vertical speed up and down. Of course, our speed forward, which is in knots in this helicopter. And we want to make sure our rotor RPM is at about 500 to 520 and our engine speeds are 2750 to 2900. Our manifold tells us how much power we're pulling. Normally in a cruise, I'm right around 17 to 18 inches of manifold. And we're located right now at 1,393 feet, so our altimeter's already set for that for takeoff. And then usually what I do is I set this clock here. Like right now it says it was on an hour, which was my last flight. And this is just kind of my manual backup for quantifying how much fuel I have. So I'll zero this clock back out because I really don't care what time it is. I just care how long I've been flying. And I set that up and then when I fire up the helicopter, this is activated. Now on my cylinder head temp and on my uh, exhaust temperature, there's a four-way switch to this gauge. But my hottest cylinder tends to be cylinder number three, so I'm going to use this gauge most of the time, switch to cylinder number three, and I watch the temperature in here and I want to make sure that my cylinder head temp doesn't go over 400 degrees Fahrenheit, and I sure as heck don't want it to go over about 1300 Fahrenheit on the exhaust side. Then down here is my fuel gauge, it monitors both tanks. So we know if we have a clog or an airlock or a problem, we're not going to run out of fuel somehow. We can watch both levels. Our engine oil pressure is also real critical. As long as it stays in the green, we're okay. And then we have two oil temperatures. One is the engine, which I don't like to see over about 190, 195, and the main transmission, which also shows me what I'm doing with that gearbox as far as putting power into it. It gets hotter as you put more power into it. And of course, if the day is real hot, the ambient air temperature could push it over the temp limit. However, that's never happened with this. It normally, in flight, it's around 120 degrees, which is real acceptable. And then of course, I monitor the alternator with my amperage and my voltage. And I have my column radio, and I have my, uh, what is it, my encoding altimeter, and goodies set up for this, so if I ever go out into controlled airspace, but I rarely do, and I rarely use this, but it's here just in case. Now my fuses, they're nothing but a circuit breaker. They really don't blow a fuse, just the breaker itself pops out if there's a short, and I can control all my little goodies such as nav lights and my clock and so on right here. And typical starting is pushing the mixture in, turning the master on, and flipping over to both magnetos. So once I hit that start button, this thing will fire right off and we can begin flying. But to get back to the helicopter itself, uh, we didn't cover too much of what the XP2 is all about.